From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 530, streaming now. Welcome back now at 530, continuing coverage of Election Day 2020 as time is running out to make sure your voice is heard. And even in the pandemic, kids will still get to visit Santa this year, but the visits will be a little different. Topping our lineup on this election day. Now voting by phone sounds convenient. Other countries have started doing it. We're taking a look at what it would take for that to happen here in the United States. And these high school students, well, they can't vote yet, but we will take you inside their political fantasy football system that's helping them predict the election outcome. And this has been an especially stressful time during this election season, hasn't it? Well, we're gonna take a look at the signs that you need to be watching for that what you're feeling is more than just regular anxiety. Now first at 530, only a half hour left to get in line to cast your vote in central Indiana. If you're in line when the polls close at six, you will still get to vote. WRTV's Megan Sanctorum joins us live now from Allisonville Christian Church. Megan, how does the line look like right now? Well, Amanda, this has actually been one of the busier and more popular polling locations throughout the day. But if you take a look behind me, you can see there is no line at all. Voters are able to wa walk right in through those doors and go straight to the polls. Now, this wasn't the case all day, though. The line was pretty steady for most of the day and afternoon. Voters could expect about a half hour wait. Poll workers tell me the longest lines were early this morning before and as the polls opened, some people then waiting for around two hours. Now I just got another update from poll workers and so far they say they have seen about 1900 voters at this location and with all of those voters, no major issues to report. The only thing they ran into is earlier in the day, they did run out of change of address ballots or forms for voters who needed to change their address. However, somebody was able to bring more within the hour and it only impacted one voter, that voter did have to go to a different location. Now, as you mentioned, once again, voters have until six o'clock to come out and make it in this line. So final half hour of voting here. Reporting live, Megan Sanctorum, WRTV. Megan, thank you for all your updates tonight. And you won't miss a thing tonight here on WRTV as the returns come in. It's election day live at WRTV, your place for continuous local updated coverage throughout the evening. Look for us on the WRTV app on your streaming device for analysis, live reports, and of course results. We will also provide you live results throughout the night here on WRTV with a complete wrap up on the news at 11. Kevin. That sunset looks so nice right now. 532 right now. Sun will set by 541 and temperatures will fall off from there. Yeah, it won't be any big temperature drop, but obviously looking at the JW Marriott and then Victory Field could have played some baseball today. Let's give you another view of the setting sun. I'll step out of the way and you can see that's Boomer there in the front of the pontoon boat on a sunset cruise. Thanks to uh, Captain Fazenmeyer for sharing the picture at Eagle Creek this evening, just as the sun Sun sets temperature 63 in Indianapolis. We were up to 66 earlier. Big winter up in Lafayette. They were almost at 70 degrees. It sounds better to say it that way. 69 the official high, 67 the current temperature. Temperatures the next several days will be mild. Look at the overnight lows making some progress. Remember it was Monday morning. We were down to 23 in Terre Haute, 26 in Indy. These overnight temperatures stay rather warm. Tomorrow, sunshine temperature by the time we get to 11 a.m. 58. There are the afternoon highs tomorrow all in the upper 60s. First Lady Melania Trump cast her vote today in South Florida. You're taking a look at video of her walking into a voting center in Palm Beach. First Lady spokesperson says she was the only person inside the polling place at the time. Meanwhile, the president visited the RNC annex in Virginia today. He is now back at the White House. Now, as for former Vice President Joe Biden, he was in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Uh, this is a video of him visiting his childhood home in Scranton with his granddaughters. The former vice president also visited, visited his son Bo's grave in Delaware. Now our team is looking at three big factors to closely watch as your phone starts buzzing with news and results tonight. First off, just how smoothly the mail-in and day of vote count goes. Also, will the turnout among black and Latino voters change this election and why we should be watching other races besides just the presidential race? 
Amaya Rodriguez in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. It's a county where they will not start processing those mail-in ballots until tonight. Election watchers are eager to see how quickly states can process ballots with record-breaking numbers of those being mail-ins. Here in Pennsylvania, they don't have as much experience as other states in dealing with such high numbers of mail-in ballots, and about two and a half million have been returned here so far. And with 20 electoral votes at stake, all eyes will be on the Keystone State, where officials warn it could take days to count all the ballots. I'm Cesar Rodriguez. Will the record number of voters in Texas, for example, be enough to change the state blue? This year, now more than ever, a push to get Latino voters out to the polls in places like Texas, right here in Arizona, Nevada, and California. In other states, African Americans are also being encouraged to go out to the polls, while the organizers of these initiatives wait nervously for those results. I'm Joe St. George in Washington, D.C., and while the presidential race is getting plenty of attention, what happens tonight in the Senate will have an enormous impact. As a reminder, currently there are 53 Republican senators and 47 Democratic senators. These are all the states with Senate races this year. Republicans think they can flip a seat in Alabama. Democrats think they're in a good position to pick up Arizona, Colorado, North Carolina, and Maine at least. Remember, the Senate confirms judges, helps pass bills, confirms cabinet positions. Whoever wins the presidency needs the Senate to get their agenda accomplished. And we will be tracking all of it, but as we get back to our lineup here, there are so many different ways to cast your ballot. Doesn't voting by phone sound a bit convenient? They have started doing it in other countries. We're taking a look at what it would take for that to be reality here in the U.S. Senior election officials say there has been no sign of foreign interference affecting votes. The U.S. recently did accuse Iran of sending voter intimidation emails and Russia of hacking into two local government networks. However, voting machines are rarely connected to the Internet, and there's been nothing on the scale of the 2016 interference. Officials are confident that vote counting and certification systems are secure. Now, many of us trust our smartphones with a lot of private information. So... Why can't we use them for voting? Well, there's a handful of countries who have some sort of online voting and they've been doing it for years, but that's just not the case here in the US. Communications on our mobile phones are, don't reach the level of security, frankly, that our current election and voting mechanisms give us. Now that is Suzanne Spaulding. She is an advisor to Nozomi Network. She's also the former cybersecurity undersecretary with the Department of Homeland Security. Now Spaulding says voting by phone brings up more accessibility issues. Not everyone has access to strong broadband or Wi-Fi. It also doesn't allow for a paper trail, which is key to reassurance after hacking claims. No, vote, voting by phone would require a massive investment in securing networks. Now, for perspective, banks spend a lot of money on security, and they also have backups and insurance in case of a breach. Now, that means voting by phone would have to be even more secure than online banking, and election officials just do not have that level of resources. That's what would be required for people to both feel confident that their vote is uh, going to be counted as cast and that it is a confidential vote, both of which are fundamental values uh, in our election system. Spalding says some voting in Alaska is done online, but the risk there is just so small that it doesn't really translate to when we think about it on a nationwide scale. Still, she thinks voting by phone is something that we can think about as a long-term goal. All right, next in our lineup, these high school students, they can't vote yet, but we will take you inside their political fantasy football system that's helping them predict the election outcome. Now, while protecting ballots has been top of mind this election cycle, there's also been a concern about protecting people's health as they vote during a pandemic. Chris Conti shows us how some groups were trying to get seniors safely to the polls. The road to American democracy has been paved with plenty of uncertainty this year. Concerns about voter safety only compounded by COVID. That is Barbara Mullen. She's a volunteer who spent this election day at a senior center, giving anyone who needed it a ride to go vote, including this 79-year-old who doesn't have a car. Once she got to the polls, Barbara then began disinfecting her car, something she's never done in years past. Making sure that the young lady who we're helping get to the poll is safe. 
Barbara is with Souls to the Poles, a nonprofit that typically would offer rides to hundreds of seniors across the nation. This year, though, those efforts had to largely be scaled back because of COVID concerns. A lot of the folks that we're transporting today are our most vulnerable populations. In Providence, Rhode Island, where Barbara is a volunteer, masks were required for anyone getting a ride. Only one person was allowed in a car at a time. We believe that we want as many people to vote as possible. James Vincent is with the NAACP. For them, offering people rides to the polls is a critical part of increasing voter turnout. Getting these people there is key. We want to make sure that everybody that wants to vote can vote. Across the country, companies and nonprofits also partnered with Lyft and Uber to provide free or reduced rides to the polls today. Studies show that back in 2018, only 36% of Americans without access to a car made it to the polls. Even scooter companies were offering discounts to encourage democracy today, anything to help get out the vote. I believe that we're at a uh, very key point in our history. Uh, we're fighting for the soul of America. In the middle of a nationwide pandemic, a nation at a democratic crossroads, trying to vote however they safely can. In Providence, Rhode Island, I'm Chris Conti. Chris, thank you. And a college student flew from North Carolina home to Colorado to make his voice heard this election. Jonas Asner says his parents sent his ballot by priority mail mid-October, but as the deadline crept closer, it still hadn't arrived. So his family decided that the flight was worth it to make sure that he could vote. Be able to have a voice in my country is really important to me. It was definitely cool to vote in my first presidential election just as a milestone in my life. Asner flew home Sunday night, voted Monday, then was flying back the next day. The southwestern Indiana town of Santa Claus is in for some new national exposure. The small town known for its year round Christmas theme is going to be featured in an upcoming TV special on HGTV. Producers will soon travel to the Spencer County town to film Surprising Santa Claus, a TV special hosted by Laura Spencer of ABC's Good Morning America and HGTV's Flea Market Flip. As part of the special, two Santa Claus families will be surprised with home renovations. More than 100 families vied for a chance for those renovations, and the producers chose four finalists, two of whom will receive the surprise. The director of the Spencer County Visitors Bureau hopes the exposure will bring more people to town once the pandemic ends. The special is set to air on Christmas. And Santa Claus the person is also coming to town, but visits will look a little different this year because of the pandemic. Simon Malls say Santa will arrive starting November 27th and will be available for socially distanced visits until Christmas Eve. Santa and his helpers will be wearing face coverings. Face coverings are also required for those ages two and up. This year's guests will not be able to sit on Santa's lap. Walk up visits will be available, but reservations are strongly encouraged. Those can be made online at simonsanta.com. I'm just glad that Santa will still be coming to make a visit. Nothing can stop Santa. <laughs> it's wonderful weather for a newscast together with you. As you can see on the horizon, nice and orange sky, and we've been gloating about our weather today in Indiana on this election day. I want to show you around the country. Uh, they, too, enjoyed great weather. The coldest air has been pushed out of the U.S. really into Ontario and Quebec, Canada, with an exception. 38 in Boston, while it's 61 in the nation's capital. Look at the warmth in the central U.S. 74 in Minneapolis. It's just 2 degrees from Miami's temperature of 76 and out to the west, comfortable. As far as any major weather systems, there are none. There are a few flurries uh, off the Great Lakes. Other than that, you're looking at a couple of showers in the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, Seattle down to about Portland, otherwise quiet everywhere. So weather not an obstacle headed out to the poles. You start to see the city lights take over. Skies stay clear tonight. We're right back to tons of sunshine during the day tomorrow, and we repeat it all over again with temperatures again in the upper 60s. We're cooling off 63 in Indy now, down three degrees from the afternoon high. Temperature in Bloomington at 61 as we go through the evening. Steady drop temperature by midnight just in 
in the upper 40s. We'll stay in the 40s overnight tonight. We've even got low temperatures that will stay in the 50s in the seven day forecast. Again, what's unusual about this November warmth is not that it's warm. It's that it will stay warm for a prolonged period of time. We'll have consecutive days with temperatures well above average. We'll move from the 40s into the upper 60s tomorrow. Thanks to this, a strong south wind that's certainly been a component of our weather systems having stronger wind associated with them. 68 in Indy tomorrow, low 70s in Columbus, Bloomington and Terre Haute right at 70 degrees each Wednesday through the day tomorrow. Temperature 58 late morning, afternoon temperature again in the upper 60s. What changes on Thursday? More in the way of cloud cover. We'll talk more about the weekend and beyond coming up. While political pundits go over tonight's election results, thousands of high school students around the country have been hard at work forecasting their own. Dan Grossman shows us the world of political fantasy football and how it's engaged high school students in the political process even before they can vote. If you are willing at home to flip your cameras on, that would be awesome. In this most untraditional of years. Dan, are you going to want to be able to see this at all, or is the footage going to be okay? We got to sit in on teacher Chris Stewart's high school social studies class in Minnesota and see what it's like to learn in 2020. I'm going to show you my um, election map. And how he's managed to engage his students, many of whom are at home, in a political process in which they are too young to take part. I only offer this course once every four years. Um, I, I really do feel like that makes the kids feel like they're part of something special. He calls it fantasy politics. Think a March Madness basketball bracket for the presidential election. It's something fun. It's something different that the kids can kind of get a little competitive about. Um, friendly academic competition. One that government and economics teacher Gerald Huskin helped form from his classroom in Pennsylvania prior to the 2016 election. Right now we're kind of looking at the different data from NBC, ABC, stuff like that. Um, and right now it's saying it looks pretty good for Joe Biden, but, you know, we thought that going into 2016. The kids get to draft states in a fantasy football format. They then learn about what's important to their voters, research news articles and polls, and then predict what they think will happen in 2020 based on what they find, putting together their minds and entering the bracket in a nationwide challenge. I filled it out yesterday. I have... Biden winning pretty comfortably. It's allowed juniors like Mason to see how different states approach different issues. It's pretty unpredictable, but that's like one of the best parts about this course is that that's kind of politics. It's really unpredictable. And taught seniors like Amber how voter patterns change among different regions and demographics. If you ask me in 20 words or less, why do you teach this course? Um, it, it's, it's really because I feel like high school students, whether or not they're voters, look at our political system and our political institutions and they feel like they have no agency. In a day and age where everyone has an opinion, it's building the foundation for an intelligent one. I have both Ohio and Florida going Republican this year, I have both of them giving Trump some votes. While keeping it light enough to keep those opinions civil and the environment engaging. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. All right, Dan, thank you. Now, once the polls close, you'll see some major news outlets start declaring winners before all the votes are counted. Now, that is part due to Edison Research. It's a company that does exit polling, which are surveys of voters as they leave the polling place. Now, they also do telephone surveys to gauge mail-in voting trends. Now, when Edison surveys and exit polls show a race is not close, network decision teams will make a, an Insta call. And there's certain cases where we can project even someone who has fewer votes at a, at a given moment will win because we know he will win so much of the remaining vote in, in a certain location. So I'm proud to say that no network has made an incorrect call since the 04 cycle. Now, Edison started in 2004 after the 2000 presidential race when networks incorrectly called the race between Bush and Gore. Now, 2020 has been a banner year for gun sales. Small arms analytics and forecasting is estimated more than 16 million guns were sold through September, making 2020 the top year for gun sales ever. Sales first started going up during the pandemic. Then there was another increase during the summer when we saw protests. And now the election is giving gun sales another push. It's unprecedented. We haven't had that level of firearms sales in the United States uh, before even if you were to adjust for population growth, income growth, those sorts of things. It's, uh, it's utterly out of the norm. Recent numbers show that crime rates are relatively low at the moment. Now, finally, in our lineup, this has been an especially stressful election season, wouldn't you say? Well, the signs that 
you really need to be looking for to make sure what you're feeling isn't just regular anxiety. Well, there is growing concern over election stress disorder. A doctor who studies and treats PTSD tells us the volatility of the political landscape is adding to the pandemic anxiety so many people are already dealing with. A certain percentage of those people are going to develop persistent anxiety disorders, PTSD, and so on. And you don't have to necessarily have like a one discrete trauma to develop PTSD. It could be just multiple little micro traumas. Stress related to elections, it's not unprecedented. A quarter of college students in a study found that they experienced PTSD symptoms in 2016. Increased tensions could mean more people are feeling that right now. Now, some may not meet the criteria for a PTSD diagnosis, but can still experience irritability or panic attacks. Now, those who develop PTSD can be at a higher risk for other health complications like heart attacks. People talk about PTSD as an invisible wound. My point is it's invisible if you have the wrong scanner. If you have the right scanner, like a functional MRI or a PET scanner, you can actually see it. Now, there are several steps that he suggests for dealing with election stress. Be thoughtful about just how much political content you consume. Isolation is increasing mental health problems, so make sure you're talking with people. Get some good sleep. Take time to exercise. If you're still feeling these issues, explore treatment options. Now, for many people, the big issue this election, it's not the economy, it's their health. Uh, a little over three years ago, I walked into a doctor's office with a nagging cough and walked out with a stage four cancer diagnosis and everything changed for me all at once. Tomorrow, how some say all other political issues pale in comparison to having affordable health insurance and the role that some hope leaders play in finding a solution. It may have felt like we had record temperatures today, but the record high all the way up to 77. Our high today, 66. Here's temperature pattern through the evening hours. By the time we get to the late news, 49 degrees. It never gets too cold tonight. We'll stay in the 40s. We'll talk about our long range pattern and when some rain will return in the seven day forecast. That's all for the news at 530. The news at six starts right now.